the history behind drone technology, a lot of people don't realize that it's actually been there for a long time. It's become um, a bit more kind of pertinent in the press uh, in the last couple of years, maybe four or five years. But these things have been around a very long time. Um, and just a little bit of background to those. Um, we'll talk about the technology itself, a little bit how they operate, um, some of the small little the flight controllers maybe, um, and the sensors that we can put on these machines and the various jobs that they can do. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, what we do ourselves more in the, in the search and rescue space and the technology that we've developed um, ourselves. Um, so I, I guess the first thing really is when I'm kind of mentioning drones um, here this evening, I, I'm not referring to what will be the most commonly available off-the-shelf drone. And if you were to ask, I'd say stop 100 people on the street outside there and say draw a, a drone or what you see to be a drone. That's probably what they draw because it's uh, one of the most common, common drones available on the market. It's a DJI Phantom, 1500 euros, 30 megapixel camera, it has a return to home functions, fully autonomous, all these nice stuff. Uh, but it's, it's kind of a market dominator. And then we have these kind of tiny spec drones. I saw one of the guys had a little one there. He was, yeah, there he is. <laughs> a little hand-sized, pocket-sized drone. You can buy them for 20 euros on the lower end. And then you go into uh, a company in Shannon, actually. They're a Turkish company who are developing uh, and building these uh, drones in Shannon in the industrial estate there, um, ATEC SIN. And then you're looking at in the region of three quarters of a million euros for something a bit more sophisticated. Uh, three meter wingspan, eight hour endurance, uh, kind of a, a much more robust machine than what you can buy off the shelf for, for 20 euros. Um, but at the same time, what I'd like to say at this point as well, all the time with these machines, it's very important to realize that there isn't a linear uh, line of cost versus capability. If it's more expensive, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's more capable, okay? And that's something that is probably a bit more of an exponential curve. Um, than a, than a linear curve, and that's important. Just a bit about myself then, a um, bit of background, um, I suppose to prove to you that I'm not bluffing. <laughs> I didn't learn this off this morning. Um, uh, my career in aviation began with a, a degree in aeronautical engineering from the University of Limerick. Uh, I did four years there, graduated in 2002. Um, I worked in Airbus as well for most of a year um, where I was working as a performance engineer uh, over in Toulouse. And I kind of realized when I was there that I wasn't really up for the office job. And much, much and all, as I loved aircraft, um, my heart was really into flying. Uh, I applied for the Air Corps that year, my final year, and I got the Air Corps. Um, I flew fixed-wing aircraft for a couple of years, uh, Marchetti, King Air, um, up to the PC-9. Uh, we were the first uh, bunch, bunch of guys qualified on the PC-9. And I did my helicopter course then uh, in 06, I think it was. Um, and I flew EC-135. And then went on to fly the Augusta Westland 139 helicopters when they were brought into the Air Corps as well. Um, I went back to the school then, to flight training school, and I flew there for another year, did my flight instructor's course, and flew training the cadets uh, for a year in the PC-9, which was a nice change. And then I was put back in as the chief helicopter instructor in the Garda Air Sport unit. So I was flying the Garda Air Sport helicopter then. I was actually there. They gave me the, the, the line that I'd be there for two years, and uh, I was there for seven years in total flying there but it was great experience and that's a picture of me there in, in that machine and we introduced things like night vision goggle technology and, and really kind of developed that end um, for the guard air sport unit um, i'm now the chief helicopter instructor in the helicopter school uh, out in baldonnell so we train um, all of our helicopter pilots once they finish the wings course they come across to us and we do ab initio training on helicopters from nothing up to fast roping cargo singing winching um, night vision, night flying, um, instrument flying, uh, about 150 hours total, and then they're fully operational. Um, so that's my job at the moment. About three years ago, during my instructor's course, um, which I was told beforehand it was quite difficult, but it actually really wasn't, because there were six of us, we figured that we had loads of time. Um, and myself and a colleague of mine from the Air Corps, Gerard Breen, um, randomly discovered this drone technology one day. And we said, let's invest in a drone. And we had a vision of being taken over the world of aerial photography and videography. And we set about uh, taking aerial photographs of people's houses. And we put on our best babe and tucker and went knocking door to door like salesmen, telling them what videos and what photographs uh, we could take of their houses. And we got a little bit of money, which was fantastic. <laughs> but I'd say within three months, we were calling to people's doors. Uh, and they were saying, there was a fellow here last week. And I was like, 
this road lad is going out trying to get business behind my back. So I was saying to him, were you here last week? And he was like, no, I wasn't, but they were two a penny. And people were buying them online. They're, everyone had that same vision because they were so accessible. Um, and then we realized, well, if we're flying them in areas that we probably shouldn't have been flying them, well, then so is everybody else. And then I had a concern about flying into one of these machines in the Garda helicopter because we fly low level. Or maybe the search and rescue guys would fly into one of these machines. And we talked to the IA and said, do you guys have any sort of regulation or do you have sort of training? And there was uh, a training academy down in Cork, but no one knew about it. And then we set up uh, a drone training company, I suppose, with a view to educating people um, with uh, the best practice in unmanned technology. So we set up Flyer at Drone Academy about three years ago. We've been operating um, here in Ireland, internationally, and um, we have trained most, I suppose, 90% of the agencies. And then during that time, we were realizing that the guys were using these drones to great effect, and they were really effective, but there was something missing. There was something in the technology, there was something in the software they were using that didn't allow them to, to be as capable as they should be. Um, things like sharing location, how do you know where the drone is, um, how do you see the field of view of the camera on the ground? What are you actually looking at when you're looking at in, in the camera view? And then that's where we came up with, we co-founded we co a company called DroneSAR, which is a software company. We've developed a, a world's first um, drone search and rescue software that enables these machines with a range of rescue specific functions. So we actually basically took what's in a helicopter <laughs> autopilot system and we took all the notes and then we just made it for a drone. So it's the same thing, but just on drone on an iPad. Uh, and that's, we've, uh, we've our product ready, we'll be launching in the next two weeks, um, but we partnered with some of the leaders in, in, in the industry, in the world, um, it's been very exciting. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of background of me and where, where we're going and what, what our vision is, I guess. Um, so I suppose there's nothing better than a video to show you what this technology can do and what it's capable of. I let the video play, uh, there is a little bit of music in the background, I'll play it here, but um, not too important. Uh, and I guess, I suppose it's just nice to highlight um, the effectiveness of these machines, particularly in a rescue situation. I mentioned earlier um, this idea of size versus capability and cost versus capability. That um, video was taken with a DJI Mavic, which is 1,200 euros, and you can see the effect that that would have on 
a search and rescue team, for example, Maritoni, who's in the video, Doolan Coast Guard, they spend their time driving the boat from Doolan all the way to the Cliffs of Moher. Even on the calmest days, there's going to be a shore lap. There's these huge boulders. It's massively difficult for them to get in and see those caves and see those areas. And if they can't get in with the boat and they have to recover something, they have to abseil down an 800-foot cliff face, a sheer cliff face. It's insane what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, but at least they have some form of search tool. They won't be able to recover anything with the drone, however, uh, but they have some form of search tool. Um, yeah. um, a couple of interesting things uh, with this here. This is, I, I'll talk about this later, but this is the kind of screen that you get on a, on a standard off-the-shelf software, and you can see there's nowhere here where there's a lat-long coordinate, so you want to tell the person where you are. You can't do that. Um, you can switch over to map mode, and you can try and maybe explain where they are on the video screen. Um, you can record here, you can change from camera to video mode. You can do an automatic takeoff. It'll take off itself and it'll climb to 1.2 meters, I think it is, and it'll sit there until the battery goes down and it'll land itself. Um, you can land if you're away somewhere, you can just return to home, hands off. So it actually takes a little bit of the skill out of the... the is anybody fly model aircraft here? No? Yourself? I say you hate these, do you? People coming in, there's no motor skill development. No. <laughs> no. I'll tell you about it later. We'll talk about it later, yeah. Generally, there's a big, big clash there with these guys. But um, some very useful information camera, distance heights, all that kind of stuff, vertical speed, horizontal speed, very smart, and it's very kind of ergonomically uh, designed. But that's the off the shelf software um, that's available for the drones. Um, so, where did they come from? Well, I guess um, we all probably know this picture the Wright Brothers, uh, December 17th, 1903 with the first um, power or first manned aircraft flight. Um, and I suppose what's a little, little, uh, little known fact is that the first unmanned aircraft flight was only eight years after this flight. And people normally associate it with 2011 or the Predators or the US Air Force unmanned aircraft. But actually, there was a little um, aircraft called a Kettering Bug, which was a rail launched aircraft four piston um, engine and they'd drag it along this this rail and then they'd start the engine very cleverly they knew the bite of the propeller so they knew that in one rotation of the propeller it would go a certain distance and then they'd calculate the wind of the day and they knew that if it went 64,583 rotations at whatever altitude it was at and the glide ratio <laughs> that they knew exactly where it would land and what it actually was in fact was a one-way delivery system for munitions. So they used to fill this thing full of explosives and then just let it glide into whatever area. And it was, I suppose, an early day uh, cruise missile uh, for better, uh, which we have nowadays. Uh, but that was the start of it. And that was only eight years. It was kind of World War I that they were flying. And then technology kind of began to develop then between the wars, between World War I and World War II. And in World War II, um, there was a guy uh, called Reginald Denny. He was a Hollywood, aspiring Hollywood actor, they say. And he had a, a company called the Radio Plane Corporation. He won a, co a, a contract, um, probably through a lengthy tender process, I'd imagine, uh, with the US Air Force um, to build, uh, it was between nine and, nine and 10,000 uh, of his uh, drones so that they could use it for target practice. And they had these uh, pilots going out to uh, better their skills by dogfighting, and they used to fly into each other and crash each other when they could send these machines to fly around and the pilots would go around and fly and shoot them down rather than shooting each other down and crashing into each other. But he had uh, a lady working for him um, at the time. Uh, Norma Jean Baker was her name. And she was a drone, uh, unmanned aircraft technician. And when he said, my company is going to be pretty famous, I need uh, somebody to be on the cover of the, uh, on the, the company posters. And he picked this lady. And then she later changed her name to Marilyn Monroe and became an international sex symbol. So there's hope for us yet. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to lose hope. <laughs> but her job before she became this really famous person was uh, actually a drone technician, would you believe? There's a point of useless information for you for a, a pub quiz someday. Um, but it wasn't really until um, September 9-11 is really when the transfer from what was a, a kind of out of reach military technology uh, transferred over to the civilian side. And you had the, the big manufacturers like DJI who were making hundreds of thousands of these machines and it became really, really accessible for, for agencies and for people to buy. And you had a big input from um, the fire departments and police, particularly in New York, who were going to use this technology uh, to help them do their jobs. Uh, and that was really the kind of turning point, I guess, for the aviation industry, manned aviation, and also 
uh, for the unmanned uh, aviation. So where are we at on the world scene? Well, Ireland historically has a massive aviation culture. Um, the Irish Aviation Authority have uh, a really impressive safety record in safety audits um, in Europe. They'd be ranked in the top three. In the world, they're probably ranked in the top 10. There's a massive aviation base, huge aviation leasing business here, a huge amount of aircraft that are registered on the Irish Register, uh, and we're kind of ahead of the game when it comes to manned aircraft, and it's no different for unmanned aircraft. And in 2011 or 2012, the IA came out with um, a very loose set of regulations. Uh, just to the left of that, you have the DJI Inspire. You're probably coming down to about three and a half, four grand for that one, interchangeable cameras. You can have a, a dual operator, so you can have a pilot fly the drone, and you can have a second guy move the camera, which is really great uh, and very helpful in, in rescue in particular. Coming down another notch, you have uh, the DJI Phantom 4, uh, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, about 1,500 euros, buy that off the shelf, uh, equally as capable, but just without the interchangeable cameras, uh, it's just got a one stock camera, it's gy fully gyro stabilized, and then down a step from that again is the DJI Mavic, which um, mountain rescue teams are going absolutely mad for because you can just put it on a little pouch and you can go wherever you want to go rather than bring in the big pelly case that weighs 15 kilograms as well as your stretcher and all your other things that you need to bring. Uh, you can just throw this on a little pouch or in a backpack and off you go. Job done. And it weighs uh, 750 grams. So uh, it folds out into a similar enough size to this machine and it is equally capable, I think, if not better than these machines. And that's, that's kind of where we're going. There's also smaller versions than that in the last since I did this presentation, there's actually more uh, smaller ones. The second-hand market is flooded with them, <laughs> and here's why. Um, so, how do they work? So, um, basically, on a, on a quadcopter, I'll speak just about quadcopters initially. There's 13 pieces that, are, that you need to have working on a quadcopter. And if one of those 13 parts fails, it falls directly out of the sky. And that is four props, four motors, four ESCs, or electronic speed controllers, that are in here. So we have a prop, we have a motor, and in the arm is a speed, speed controller that's attached to the flight controller. And if any one of those 13 pieces of technology lets you down, um, well, then it'll fall directly out of the sky. Um, and DJI, when they released the Phantom 1, which is one of the first ones that we bought, we bought one of the first Phantoms in the country, it was a GoPro camera that you had to buy separately. It was strapped onto the bottom of the, the drone. So when we were taking photographs in wind, they were all sideways. Because the drone is like this, canting into wind, and the photographs are sideways. You had to have a separate link, which was the wireless link from the GoPro to an iPad or something to watch it, uh, which was very short. So we were limited all of a sudden by how far you could go to get good footage. Very quickly, they introduced, and it was uh, 12 versions uh, up to today and actually since I did this presentation there's two more so there's 14 versions of this drone on its own between 2013 and, and 2018 uh, and they've brought it up from uh, a GoPro strap to the bottom of a really simple um, drone here up to uh, fully gyro stabilized HD cameras uh, position sensors so you can not fly into trees you can not fly into walls uh, position sensors underneath in the absence of GPS it knows what pattern the ground is so it won't move um, fully wireless links that will give you eight kilometers of flight time or flight distance without any interruption of signal um, and the price uh, has remained pretty much constant it's like the Apple of Apple of drones and then with the advent of the the Mavic you're looking at much smaller drones but the technology is the exact same uh, in it um, so that's kind of where the industry has developed from uh, just in one particular machine and it's very developed and what's new today I can tell you if we were to have this conversation again in six months there'd be another batch of drones up here and there'd be another versions and it'd be totally different and uh, the industry and the regulation changes so fast and it's a big problem for aviation authorities because they can't keep up they're regulators they have to write rules and it has to go to the houses and stuff to get um, passed um, and brought into law and by the time it's brought in so this has changed in the year that it took from to get this across the line everything has changed uh, and the regulation needs to be changed and it's a constant struggle in fairness to them I hate to have to do that job uh, but they do it very well in fairness to them so what do we put on them or what can we do with the sensors on board it's all very well having a flying platform but what can we put on the platform to make them useful uh, and with the stock cameras uh, with the red green and blue 
um, frequency ranges, we can use them to determine uh, what quality of crops, whether it's good crops here and bad crops or whatever, I'm not really into that now, but on the agriculture side, you can determine the thickness of trees, uh, the growth of, uh, growth of grass, um, that's the grass in the fields and that's the other stuff. Um, uh, and you can determine what, where your fertilizer has been spread, um, more kind of concentrated than, than, than less, uh, all with the off-the-shelf off the cameras. And that's just with uh, frequency ranges. Obviously not massively accurate at the lower level, but you can buy multi-special cameras that can do all that um, at a much higher level, a much more accurate level. Um, obviously we have just basic thermal imagery, which we've done. This is a screen grab from a video we did in Donegal. A pitch black night, I'll show you a video in a moment, where we had the search party searching around and then we could see where the casualty was and it's such an easy thing to talk people or share location where the casualty is and they can just go directly to them uh, and it takes all the messing out of trying to describe where somebody is or something is yeah um, more recently uh, with the newer drones we have um, follow me functions where the drone recognizes you in the pixels and the images and as you walk around it the drone stays 30 meters up and 30 meters back from you whatever parameters you put in as you walk along it will follow you and it was a company in Ireland uh, called Movidius that uh, designed that chip a very uh, powerful artificial intelligence chip and uh, I think they were sold 60 million or something there recently and um, so that's the scale that was uh, the guys are based out in Intel in, in Leakslip and then we have the the infrared uh, range so what it actually does is um, there's two ways it can do it. Um, you can have it do an active track, which is based on the person, which is this green square, so it knows that this is a person. So the computers are trained in, in models, so they know that this is a person that will go that, that direction. Or an easier way to do it is if this person has the remote control in his pocket, the drone always knows where the remote control is. Um, on the right hand there, right hand side of the last picture is the infrared, uh, which allows you to actually um, detect temperature ranges so you can see here the crosshairs is in the middle here you can see spot one is 4.4 degrees so you can imagine if it went over onto the person well then it would give you a much bigger temperature range uh, but yeah you can you can do all that stuff that thermal resistance stuff uh, is easily done with drones so you won't have the range but there we go here's a video um, so I can I intro this before I put it on and um, this is a, a search we did it was an exercise um, with a, a casualty in Donegal who was missing or simulated missing uh, it was a black of black nights um, pitch black, the teams were where we were kind of faffing around getting their gears together and they were wondering where they were going to go and how they were going to go about the search and everything and we said sure we'll, we'll fly the thermal and see if we can spot anything and we, all we did was we lifted up about uh, 200 feet I think it was, uh, you can see some sheep here, we turned the camera around uh, we see the person <coughs> and we flew to them and we dropped a, a bag with a thermal blanket and a torch to them and it took about, I don't know, maybe 90 seconds uh, and then you were able to get the team to go and get them out of there. So I kind of <laughs> took the fun out of the whole exercise, but I guess that's what we're there for. Um, <clears throat> so again, you can kind of see very vaguely just kind of a bit of a hill fog here up the top, a little bit darker. Again, it's a little bit clearer on the drone itself, but the, the pixel camera isn't, or the terminal isn't great. But you can see off in the distance something just appeared. It could have been anything now. But we said we'd have a quick look and we flew out to it. It could have been, yeah, quite easily now and just we were lucky that day, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, when we got over, you could see quite clearly that it was a person. Uh, and then you'll see as well when the drone stops and the camera goes down, you can see the bag swinging and uh, we were able to drop, release the bag and drop down uh, onto the person. Overshot the mark a bit. You can see the bag there coming in the bottom of the, the screen. And then the bag gets dropped and at least the guy has something to go on, a little thermal blanket or a, maybe a bar of chocolate or something. Um, you can see his uh, thermal signature as well where he was based um, when he was sitting on the grass. Um, so with basic software off the shelf you can download apps uh, with DJI for example. Um, that allow you to see the video feed directly to the drone. Um, you can fly the drone with the transmitter or you can put in some, some limited waypoints uh, with the iPad. But that's really as far as it goes. And this is one of the issues that the rescue team saw is this link. Uh, and 
the problems associated with it, it doesn't go any further. And the end point of the data from the drone comes back to the pilot. And I suppose what are the chances he is the subject matter expert in aerial search? Quite low. Um, and he's got a lot of other things to worry about. Weather, wind, rain, <coughs> regulation, battery life, uh, numerous things. Um, and now he's also the end point of the data, which isn't great. Um, this is an idea of the screen again of normal software. You can switch between map mode, video mode, put the map up. You can see that you can overlay satellite imagery. You can add on layers of satellite stuff. Um, maps, now they've got augmented reality that shows this map and it shows street names on the cameras. That's AGB. Um, up the top here, you have the amount of satellites that it's receiving. The green says, great, everything's good. Uh, if it's yellow, cautionary, and red uh, for, for warnings. If, if I had a euro for every time I heard this statement, I'd be a really wealthy person because everybody, every rescue agency in the world, they buy drones and they say, this is it. It's going to replace our team members. It's going to replace. When you want to do anything, it's going to solve all the problems. And it's certainly not the case because there's a number of different pitfalls that exist with them. One is motor skill development. And if you were to ask anybody when they buy a Phantom, how long does it take you to learn how to fly it? They'll say, how long does it take you to learn how to fly yours? Maximum, yeah. yeah. And if, if you were less, obviously, safe, uh, pilot, you could do it in 10 minutes if you really wanted to, because uh, it's automatic takeoff and all those nice things. So there's no motor skill development. So in the absence of the GPS, in the absence of the flight controller, these people don't know how to fly drones. They're relying on a flight controller to do it for them. So there's absolutely no motor skill. And the guys that fly model aircraft have developed that motor skill over a number of years, and they're brilliant at what they do. But drone pilots certainly don't have that. And that's really dangerous. Um, the field of view issue is day-to-day. Uh, -day we walk around uh, on our um, doing our hikes and stuff, and we've got a 210 degree field of view in our eyes. And I can see my fingers, both sides of my head here, right, and it's over 180 degrees. With drones, unfortunately, it's like viewing the world through a toilet roll holder when you're a kid and you're flying around. And that's, that's grand when you can have a reference, like there's trees and there's mountaintops and I'm going that direction. But in a search pattern, your drone camera is about 60 degrees nose down. And how do you know where that is? You're looking at the video feed and you're looking at the person and they're looking at you and you're like, how do I tell them where they are? How do I save them? How do I exchange that information? And that's something that's really difficult. If I was to say to you, um, look for a two euro coin in a football field, there's a good chance that most people in the room would start at one corner and you'd walk down along and then you'd stop a bit and then you'd go up a bit and then you'd stop and you'd just walk down again and you'd eventually find it. It might take ages, but you'd find, you could be lucky and find it early. Or, or most unlucky and find it at the other end. But you'll find it if you do it structured because you can see. And if I said to you, do it with a telescope on your, in, your, in your eyes, it would become a little bit more tricky, a little bit more difficult because you don't have that same range of view. And that's something that people don't realize. Um, we have the fly path issue. Again, you say to John up the road, will you search that area for me? He says, absolutely, Oshie, no problem at all. I'll sort that out for you. Come back in a few hours and I'll have it done and this is what you get. And then you say, are you sure that you searched the area I did most of it now, yeah, 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 yeah. Because this person's going to die if you haven't. And then it's like, oh, maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't do it all. And like, he's probably here. The drone flies all around and he flies everywhere. He could be here or he could be somewhere out here. Uh, and it's important that we uh, structure that. Um, so what we've done, we've done is taken polygons. You can drop the polygon on the map. You drag all your squares, whatever, your circles, whatever size you want. You choose your altitude and then the drone knows that a 10% overlap is going to be whatever set distance and it'll fly that polygon and you know then that that area is 100% fully searched and you can safely say that that area is done and, and completed. Um, then we have the idea of location sharing and this is really easy to explain is describe in your own mind where the boat is in that picture. And you'll very quickly realise you can't do it because there's no features, there's a, a rope it's beside the rope, it's beside the wave, oh, it's gone. There's white water, there's waves, there's nothing. And then another one would be describe where that orange boy is in that picture, in the middle of the shot. It's beside the rock, there's no features, it's all, I suppose you can't describe anything near the green slime, but there's probably another batch of green slime on the other side. Um, and that's quite difficult. So that was another issue that we, we found. And also, I mentioned very kind of quickly earlier on is, what's the chances that the drone pilot is also the search manager, the subject matter expert. And it's probably very slim that this team member is also this guy, when this guy probably sits in command and control. Um, and that they're rare that they're together, probably. Um, 
very quickly now, I'll just show you some of the tests we did and how effective they are. That's in uh, Gormanston Airfield, uh, where you have long grass, a fella there in a lying down and he's lying face down. But you could actually, we actually did try as a walking past him and you can't see him because the grass is up nearly to your waist. Like, like if you were walking along there, you wouldn't see him unless you were right on top of him. But uh, we did a number of tests with the drone at 30 degrees tilt, 100 feet. Uh, and you'll see that the, at the lesser angles, he kind of appears around here somewhere. There he is there. As you increase the camera angle to 60, 45, 60, 90, he'll kind of move up the screen a little bit. He'll probably appear here somewhere. That's actually the laptop that's doing that delay, not the drone. There he is. So be, and then we said, we'll go to 60 now, and he'll actually pop up a little bit here. Um, you'll see him a little bit easier. There he is. So you can see him the whole way down the screen, which is better. And then 90 degrees, obviously, is going to give you the whole lot. But again, it's very hard. Without some kind of forward-facing view, it's very difficult to see where you're going. And he pops in. But the field of view is actually quite narrow. And he pops past really quickly. So we reckon about 60 degrees was the, the optimum tilt for, for searching. And we did this at various altitudes. And even at 200 feet there, you can see there's a huge area. Uh, but if you're quick enough, you'll spot him here as he goes past. But it could be equally, it could be over here, and you might miss him. Uh, and it was important to try and structureize those flight paths. So what have we done? So our um, drone server, we kind of consider an advanced um, software. And you remember before, we had the basic software with the iPad and the drone. Uh, and what we've done is providing an IoT, I'll come back to you in one second, an IoT solution um, for the use of drones in emergency response. So while you have this connection between the drone and the pilot, also we can either transfer stuff via satellite data, the helicopter crews can log in and watch the drone footage and say, well, we can winch and we can't winch them, the weather is bad, it's not a great area. The command and control guys can sit in their laptops at home, in their offices, wherever they want. We have a team app that allows team members to log in and view the footage and it crowdsources the drone data to have 100 sets of eyes watching the drone footage and not just one. All right? And it, it allows for uh, a quicker um, data processing, I guess. Uh, we've also done the location sharing, so when you find somebody or something, you can just share straight away from the drone and it sends an email, text message to all team members that are pre-entered and they all receive the lat long and the coordinates and all those nice things. Um, that's what our interface looks like. We have uh, kind of in-flight functions over here, camera lookup, hover, uh, I'm not quite sure why that is black. Um, that's a declutter button which declutters all the screen to allow you to concentrate not just on the video. We can share location, live stream that to any internet browser. You can record, you can switch between video, camera mode, you can watch the video, watch the camera. This is the camera view, you can make that big. And up here you have lat long, Arden survey grid reference. Uh, what three words is an interesting concept where they, they've divided the word, world into uh, meter by meter boxes and each box has a designator like jacket, shirt, plug. And you can tell someone, I am at jacket, shirt, plug, and it'll give you that meter by meter box rather than I'm at 53.088616 and minus 6.551039 over radio can be tricky. That's just three words. Yeah. From the browser side of things, uh, agencies with a number of drones here can have all their drones in one system. Um, and the command and control guys can sit from any internet browser, log in, see what drones are online, what are offline. They can watch the video footage, make that big or small, and they can see the drone in 2D or 3D track along the ground uh, with this has been tidied up since, but lat long, speed, satellites, battery life, all that kind of stuff. And they can watch that from anywhere in the world. They can watch it from the app as, as well. Where are we going? Well, I guess to bring in another layer of, of technology into drone technology, which is already pretty advanced. Uh, we won a competition last year, a European Space Agency competition, the Copernicus Services Challenge, uh, which is sponsored by the European Commission. And we said that on a day-to-day -day basis following disaster in disaster management, you could have teams flying search patterns with Google Maps, which is three years out of date, four years out of date, five years out of date. And these guys are trying to do, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, what would you say, accurate search patterns, um, but they have no underlay maps. They don't know what the area is like underneath. It could be this perfectly idyllic uh, view of a, a beach in Miami, but it could be torn apart by a hurricane. So what we have done is taken the uh, satellite images from the Copernicus management system and we take them in and we can overlay them on our maps and allow the pilots to have up-to-date maps within six hours of an incident happening. We can have it on our pilot interface and on our uh, browser for command and control. 
for a more, uh, more efficient search and rescue, I guess. Um, it allows pilots, rather than choosing patterns in this idyllic situation, what has actually happened, there's been a massive flood or a disaster, and this is actually what they want to search and see. Um, and allows them, I suppose, get that better informed decision-making process, I guess. Um, on the browser side, uh, we have uh, an archive of images which allows the command and control to go back in so they can look at these series of satellite images and say something happened here. Was there a drone pilot, a drone pilot flying? Yes. Here's his path. And you can pull this icon up and down and it'll bring up all the images that happened uh, on that flight path. And there's one taken every three seconds. So it gives them a, a much better picture uh, of what has actually happened in that area. And after that, um, a very interesting one. Uh, a guy emailed me on, on LinkedIn, and he said, I'm a computer science student, and I have loads of free time, and I'm sick of doing projects for college. Can I help you? I said, of course you can. <laughs> and I said, we don't have much money, but it's sort you out at some stage. And he, he, uh, we said, gave him a, a few jobs to help him with the, with the internet web browser and update our website and stuff, and he was fantastic. And then he came along and said, I'm after designing an artificial intelligence system which automatically detects people with drones. Uh, and here it is. And he, it's, it's not the first of its kind, but it is certainly the first of its kind within a search and rescue software. And it, it um, allows the drone pilot not only now to watch the drone video for things that might be in it, I don't know, is that a sign or what is it, I'm not sure. And you have all this area to, to watch, and all of a sudden it'll say, that's a person. And it recognizes people uh, as you fly. Uh, the area, so you have this huge area, this horse is moving here, you could be distracted and look up here, you could be looking over here at the sea, anywhere, but it'll highlight as you fly um, the people. Uh, this is an early model now, it's not fully accurate, but it's getting better now the more we train it. Uh, it tells you, what's this? Not sure. Looks like something, could be something over here, but it'll actually be highlighted if it's a person. And once that happens, um, the end goal, I guess, is to have uh, a bunch of guys in some command and control unit with access to 40 drones who will choose what search mission they want to fly. People will be automatically detected and the location sent back to the control room to close the loop and then everybody is, is told where to go. So anyway, very quick summary. The drone industry is dynamic. It's a hugely vast industry. There's potential for so many things in so many areas, humanitarian, agriculture, security, search and rescue. It's, it's really in its early stages of development while it was uh, a technology for many years. It's really only come to the to the civilian sector since about 2011. Uh, and that could be within industry, within bigger industries, and also just as a standalone business, certainly one to, to explore. Uh, and there's just so many areas to explore. Um, uh, definitely it's worth um, having a look in. Okay.